Well, good morning. Today is Thursday, July the 15th, and it's good to be back with you this morning. I was not able to do the daily devotion yesterday morning because it just uh, didn't coincide with the time of chapel with the kids yesterday morning down at Centrifuge. Uh, just had a great, great short stint with the kids. I tell you, I'm so proud of the kids that we have in our student ministry here. Uh, just a tremendous group of kids, uh, love the Lord, pursuing God, and I'm convinced that uh, they're going to do great things um, in the future as in their walk of Christ. Um, anyway, I am not a young man anymore, uh, 12 hours plus of driving time in just a little over 24 hours is definitely for the young in body, uh, but anyway, I got home yesterday evening after a men's ministry meeting and I uh, just had some good night's rest. So it's good to be back with you this morning. Um, Vonda and Vanessa, just wondering how your mother's surgery went. So if you just let us know. Continue to be praying for those things we mentioned Monday morning. Um, uh, Benny Petresca is having surgery, I think, uh, coming up at the end of the month. I can't remember the date. And uh, Brian Lunsford's having a knee replacement to July 27th. And Barbara, you've got your surgery coming up here real soon. So let's just continue to pray for the body. This morning we're going to pick up in the book of Habakkuk. And, uh, but there was a song that, that came to my mind and my heart. It's an old hymn, kind of been remade in the last few years by Shane and Shane. Uh, and probably not a hymn of the, the Baptist tradition. I think it more was a hymn of the Presbyterian tradition. Um, but nevertheless, just a great, uh, great old hymn, Before the Throne of God. And if you don't know the words, I just encourage you maybe just to listen to the words and, and meditate on them and think on them as, as I lead us in the song. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect need, the great high priest whose name is ever lives and pleads for me. My name is graven on his hands. My name is written on his heart. I know that while in heaven he stands, no tongue can bid me then depart. No tongue can bid Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within. Upward I look and see him there who made an end of all my sin. Because a sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me, to look on him and pardon me. Hallelujah, hallelujah.
can't quite go up to the register of key that Shane and Shane go up in, so it kind of loses its umph on that hallelujah if you can't take it up, but some of you probably could. Uh, this morning, remember, we're looking in Habakkuk, and Habakkuk's living in Judah, the southern kingdom, where the divided kingdom is, and under the rulership of Jehoiakim, who is an evil and wicked king. And Habakkuk is first making his complaint, we looked at Monday, of just the unrighteousness and all of the sin that's in the land and the wickedness and, and the perversion of the king. And he makes his complaint to God, and, and God gives him a response into his complaint that, that really kind of took Habakkuk by surprise. Um, God told Habakkuk, yes, I, I see the wickedness there, and I know you're crying out, but but there, just wait, because I am bringing judgment on Judah. And it surprised Habakkuk because the way that God was going to bring judgment on his, his people, his holy nation, the one and only nation that is really a God nation, the nation of Israel. And uh, he says, I'm going to use the Chaldeans. I'm going to use the Babylonians, those wicked, far more wicked than Judah is at the time. I'm going to use them to bring judgment on the nation. And so we pick up at the end of chapter 1 and verse 12, where Habakkuk responds to God um, in, in this pronouncement of the judgment that God's going to bring and the instrument that God's going to bring in judgment. And he first says, God, this is kind of in a shocking question, God, are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. O oh Lord, you have ordained them as judgment, and you, O oh Rock, have established them as reproof, kind of in shock. He's, in a sense, reminding God, God, you're from everlasting to everlasting, and we are your chosen people. We are your nation. God, we shall not die. Lord, we, you, you've promised provision, and you've promised care, and you've, you've promised that we'll be yours for eternity. God, you've ordained them. You, you've set apart them. You've ordained. You've set apart them to bring judgment on your righteous one, and you'd rebuke us by these wicked and evil people. God, verse 13, you who are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong, why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallow up, the man more righteous than he. And so he's appealing to the holiness of God. And he's saying, God, you can't even look upon evil. God, how in the world would you determine to use that wicked nation to judge your people Israel? And what Habakkuk is doing here is what we often do ourselves. Habakkuk is applying comparative religion. Now, here, here's what comparative religion, we might really put it in the terms comparative Christianity. He's determined that Israel or Judah is more righteous than the Chaldeans, that the Chaldeans or the Babylonians are more wicked people than they are. And God, how can you use a wicked people to judge a righteous? And what Habakkuk is doing, he's sitting there and comparing himself and comparing the people of Judah with the people of Babylon. And we do the same thing as well. You see, that comparative Christianity, I would say, is from the pit of hell. And what that is, is that you and I oftentimes look at ourselves and we can determine whether or not we are a right Christian, a righteous Christian, by looking at other Christians and comparing our lives to them. It goes something like this. God, why is this happening to me? God, I'm, I'm, living, I, I'm, I'm living a more righteous life than uh, so-and-so. God, look at their life, and they seem to be prospering, and they seem to have everything good. And God, why is this happening to me? For I am more righteous. You see, that comparative Christianity is such a trap. It's what the Pharisees did. It's really Pharisaical. 
to sit here and try to compare ourselves with someone else as a Christ follower. Because there's no other comparison that that we can make except that comparison as we look at Christ and we look at God's righteousness and, and look whether or not we are, as Peter said, being holy as he is holy. You see, it's easy for me to find, look around and find somebody that, that appears to be living a less righteous life than me. It's easy for my wife. I mean, she can look at me and say, well, at least I'm not as bad as JMO. I'm in better standing with God. And that's probably true. However, that's not the way that we are to live our life. You see, there's only one plumb line, as God has said in his word. There's only one thing that measures whether or not something is true and right. And that is the word of God. So the only standard that we have is to measure ourselves, if you will, according to the Word of God and the nature and character of Christ. When we do that comparison, we realize that, that there are many areas that we fall short in. Um, if you remember Jesus, uh, when he was speaking, he said, listen, why do you try to remove the speck of sawdust out of your brother's eye when you've got that log sticking in your eye? In other words, it's easy for us to always want to look to the other person and say, well, they're not as righteous as we are. But God says, no, that, that is not. You see, we only have one person, one person, one, one God that we have to stand before. The Bible says each man stands before his own maker. And so if you're in the trap of comparative Christianity, I would encourage you to get out of that. You see, when, when I look for someone else to compare myself to and, and, and I determine that I'm living a more righteous life than that person, what I do is I puff myself up in arrogant egotism and I can often, so and I do often, miss the, the flaws and the things that God wants to work in my heart and in my life. You see, I've got to be concerned about my walk with Christ. You have to be concerned about your walk with Christ. Now, that doesn't mean we don't come along a brother or sister that we know is in sin. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm just talking that that day-to-day -day living in the Christian life. As it is easy to look at, look around and find somebody that is less righteous than us, it's also easy to find people that we think are more righteous than we are. And what that does to us, it casts us down in a depressive state, if you will, and we always feel as though we can never measure up and earn God's love. Can I tell you something this morning? There is nothing that you and I can do to earn any greater measure of Christ's love than what he has already extended to us. You see, his love is constant. It remains the same. It never wavers. It never changes. We have been made the righteousness of God in Christ. And thank God that we have been declared righteous and clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Because if that hadn't happened when we were born again, there would be no way, I don't care how much we think we live a righteous life, that we could ever measure up to what God's standards are. You see, when, when God looks at you and I, as we've trusted Christ, he sees the righteousness of God in Christ clothing us, covered by the shed blood of the Lamb. And so Habakkuk continues to make this complaint, beginning in verse 14. He says, You make mankind like the fish of the sea, like crawling things that have no ruler. He, meaning the Chaldeans, he brings all of them up with a hook. He drags them out with his net. He gathers them in his dragnet, and so he rejoices and is glad. Therefore, he sacrifices to the net and makes offerings to his dragnet. For by them, he lives in luxury and his food is rich. Is he then to keep on emptying his net and merciless killing nations forever? I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. And so here Habakkuk kind of gives more reason as to try to justify his idea that Judah is more righteous than the Chaldeans. He, he uses a description of how wicked they are, and they, they gather men in their dragnet. And then he concludes by saying, but 
God, you've said this. I'm going to stand on my watchtower, and I'm going to look to see this come to pass. And so then God responds to him beginning in verse 2, and we're only going to go through verse 5 this morning. He says, write the vision and make it plain on tablets so he may run who reads it. In other words, write it down, make it plain, and give it to the messenger, and the messenger will carry it, and it's only going to go to the person that's supposed to read it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end, and it will not lie. It seems slow, but wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. And so what God is saying here, listen, this is a vision that I've given you, and it's going to come to pass. If I've said it, it's going to happen. And then he says in verse 4, Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by faith. And who God is talking about, and Habakkuk's answer here, is, are, is Bab the Babylonians, the Chaldeans. Chaldeans. And then he goes on to say, moreover, wine is a traitor, an arrogant man who is set at rest. His greed is as wide as shoal, like death has never enough. He gathers for himself all nations and collects as his own all peoples. And so here God is reminding Habakkuk, listen, the righteous live by faith. Speaking to the Israelite, the righteous live by faith. We know Abraham was justified by faith. He was declared righteous before God by faith. And so we have to remember that our righteousness is only applicable through our faith in God. Our works that we do are a result of our salvation, our right standing with Christ. But our salvation is secured in our faith and our trust in Christ. And then what God is beginning to unfold here to Habakkuk is, is, look, in the meantime, I'm going to use the Chaldeans, I'm going to use the Babylonians to judge the nation of Judah because they're mine. And sometimes love is expressed in judgment. We think love is this fluffy, feely kind of thing. While it does have emotions of that, love also expresses itself in judgment and discipline. And so God loves the nation of Israel. He's going to judge them. But then he begins to tell Habakkuk, listen, after that, there's coming a time where I'm going to judge the nation of Babylon. Now, this is some 60 or 70 years before this comes to pass. And he gives it to Habakkuk. And he says, listen, just wait. What I've said is going to come. And we can apply that in our lives as well, that we look around and we say, good night, how much more wicked can it be? God, when are you going to return, Jesus? When are you going to bring judgment? And we wait for it, just as the disciples did in the very first century, knowing that Jesus is going to return. And there's an end where his judgment is going to come. In the meantime, we are to look up, be watchful, for we know that our redemption draws near. What do we do in the meantime? Well, what we do in the meantime, knowing that God is going to bring that day of judgment, in the meantime, our mission, the only mission that he has given to us as a church is to go and make disciples. So today, pray and ask God, God, give me an opportunity to plant a seed of the gospel in somebody's heart. Wherever I am today, God, wherever I go, Lord, make me aware of what your spirit is doing as you are drawing people to yourself. May I plant a seed of the gospel in somebody's heart today. If I recognize that a seed has already been planted there, God, give me the words and the wisdom to cultivate that seed that's been planted. Or, oh God, if by your grace you'd let me witness you save somebody today, God, that would really make my day. And so in closing, we pray those things. God, give us an opportunity to plant a seed of the gospel. God, give us an opportunity to cultivate that soil. God, give us an opportunity to watch you save somebody. That is our mission as the church. And so let's pray that God would use us in that. And let's be intentional about it. I pray the Lord blesses you. I, I look forward to seeing you this weekend in service. Uh, going to be a great day. And so uh, either watch online or in person. And I love you and I pray the Lord's blessings that he would keep you and uh, just prosper your way. Have a great day.